Ladies and gentlemen, very welcome at this very first Vrienden of Copenhagen lecture. It's a great honor for myself, Oswald Koen, I'm the chairman of uh, the foundation, to host you all here this afternoon. It's a new initiative from our foundation. And as many know, but also many probably not net you know, uh, the Vrienden of Copenhagen is a, a group of very well committed alumni which try to support the university with all means. That is with knowledge, with introductions, with networking and with support, among others also financial support. And today is one of our new initiatives to make sure that we try to support and to connect the university with their alumni and with the outside world, because that finally is important if we also look at the theme of our university, Understanding Society. It's also a great honor that a lot of students are here today, because we all are linked with one item that a lot of us has been grad our graduation, have graduated at this university, and a lot of them today try to graduate at this university. So we all are very pleased that you are here today and we hope that we can offer you a very inspiring afternoon. Why this lecture? Um, because we do have a lot of initiatives from our foundation, uh, boardroom meetings, all kinds of other networking activities, uh, but we believe that it is very important to bring uh, high level knowledge to this university by which we can also reach the current students. And what we finally hope, of course, is when they finally graduate, that, way, that they will become a new friend of Copenhagen and that they again can support the university for many, many years. So we like to contrib contribute with our activities to our international orientation of this university. And for that reason, we are very pleased and honored to host this afternoon Professor Danny Roderick here. So once again, thank you for being here. You flew in this morning out of Boston. So the first thing I did this morning was looking outside whether there was a big fog and you could not land here. And then we had a big problem. But we are very pleased that you are here and take the time to uh, honor this very first lecture. And we also are very pleased, but I will come back to that later this afternoon, that we are, have taken the initiatives from the alumni to introduce two new scholarship, one for the best bachelor student and one for the best master student. But for that, uh, I will uh, refer to a later moment in the program. I also want to pay special attention to an initiative from one our, of our alumni, Mark van Ballegooyen, who offered us this afternoon the so-called Try Handshake app. I believe most of you have been handed over a small card. So if you are interested, and we would very please welcome you to do that, download that app and use it as a tool for making use of this very unique network. Also for the current students, uh, we believe this is a very nice tool to be connected with alumni, prominent alumni of this university. And Mark, thank you for taking this initiative for this. We also have some special uh, announcements. Uh, we have some changes in the board of the foundation. Unfortunately, Patrick Vermeulen has to stop somewhere in the first half of this year after more than 10, even 13 years. Officially, it should be 10, but okay, we have a little bit like this. Uh, and we are very pleased that Peter van Beurden will take over his position in the, in the board of the foundation. So, uh, and we welcome Peter for that. And we're also working on our next anniversary, uh, which we will try to uh, celebrate in January 2018. And in the coming weeks, we'll, we'll try to nominate a, a committee to work on that, to organize a very special program that. We also are very pleased that today we have approximately 40 alumni of this university which are not yet a member of the foundation. And of course, in daily life, I'm a businessman and I will put on my commercial uh, face, but we really hope, we sincerely hope that you will join our foundation after this meeting or somewhere in the coming months, because we believe this is really a unique group of alumni and we hope that you are connected with us and also by doing that, helping our nice and beautiful and intelligent university to further develop in that. So please, if you have any question on that, 
come to me or to one of the other board members and we will support you in that becoming a friend. And finally, we do have also a so-called Who is Who app uh, for those who are not yet in, uh, have activated that, please do that because it's another way to communicate with each other and to use the network. And then finally, some upcoming events. We probably will have a meeting in Utrecht uh, in somewhere before summer where we try to visit both the Dutch railways through our friend uh, Bart, Bert Groenewegen uh, and also the School of Catalogic, the Catalog Catalogic Theology in Utrecht, difficult always. Um, we also have two boardroom meetings, one at uh, Randstad Holding where CEO Jacques van den Broek will host us, uh, which is very interesting and we will announce in the coming months some others. And we probably will celebrate our uh, anniversary next year, January 26. So please do put that already in your agenda. Well, that's for my part of this uh, at this moment. Uh, once again, I hope we all will have a very inspiring afternoon with this first Copenhagen Vrienden of Copenhagen lecture. And I now give the floor to Sylvester Eifinger, who will introduce Danny Roderick further to you. Sylvester, thank you. Have a um, glass of water, yeah, please. Is that possible? Yeah. Welcome. Well, I see uh, that our auditorium is already fully occupied, which is, of course, what we desired, of course. <laughs> and even on the balcony, uh, there are some places occupied. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, I won't uh, repeat the welcome. I will introduce uh, uh, Danny Roderick, Professor Danny Roderick. I'm very honored and pleased to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Danny Roderick of Harvard University. We know each other for quite some time, and we both gave recently keynote speeches at the Colombian Banking Summit, you remember, in June 2016, which was a big event, the five times the audience, 3,000 people in terms of uh, academics, policymakers, uh, ministers, senators, CEOs, bankers. It's the biggest event there. And I was very impressed by the speech there by Danny Roderick in Cartagena and have asked him on behalf of the Vrienden van Copenhagen whether we would be prepared to give this first Vrienden van Copenhagen lecture in 2017 here at Tilburg University. Many people have asked me what makes Danny Roderick so special as an academic, as a columnist, as a policy advisor, and particularly as a human being. What is the secret of Uncle Danny as the students at Harvard University like to call him, which is a sign of affection eh, by the students. First of all, uh, Danny is a first-rate academic in economics, political science, and social sciences in the tradition of the political economy as our prof profession used to be called in the past since Adam Smith. Then he published path-breaking thoughts in his books on globalization, inequality, and his famous trilemma, and also on the rights and wrongs of economic science, which we will hear more of today. About this trilemma, that's a very interesting and uh, provocative thought, uh, which was launched by Denny in his first books about uh, globalization. It's about the incompatibility of globalization, national sovereignty, and democracy. As we now see in many nation states, and particularly in the EU, in the European Union. 
However, today he will speak about his last book, what you see here, here at the screen, Economic Rules. And with this, these books, especially with the last book, uh, he fits in the tradition of our founding father of Tilburg University, Professor Martinus Kobage, the priest economist Martinus Kobage, and the way Martinus Kobage saw the raison d'etre of our university by striving both for academic excellence and advancing society. Secondly, Danny is one of the few economists and political scientists who have been able to bridge the gap between academia and the real world. He published in the most prestigious academic journals, I won't repeat the whole list of publications, that uh, would be too long, but also published in the most renowned policy journals about the consequences of these academic thoughts for policy making. Moreover, he is also a monthly contributor with his fascinating commentaries to Project Syndicate, the number one opinion website in the world. I really uh, encourage you to read his commentaries monthly on every issue you can think of, economics, social sciences, politics, and Important is that you have to understand that this uh, way of dealing with recent issues is also particularly typical Danny in the sense that he's bridging the gap also to the real world problems. And thereby he has not only changed the economics and e political science profession, but also in the way important institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank have changed their perspectives and views on globalization and inequality. What used to be called the Washington Consensus, uh, that was the thought that globalization is good for everybody, for the rich, for the poor, for the middle classes, and has no consequences in terms of redistribution between the various classes. And of course, it's thanks to Danny's insights and books that uh, IMF and World Bank have changed their, also their view and also admitted that in important policy papers. He will certainly do the same with his last books on the rights and wrongs of economic science. In that book, Danny takes a close look at our discipline to examine what falls short and when it works. He argues that economics can be a powerful tool, I quote, that improves the world, but only when economists abandon universal theories and uh, focus on getting the, right, co the context right. His book is a forceful critic, both on uh, the economics profession, but also a defense of the discipline, on the other hand. Thirdly, then he has always been in the front of the troops, sometimes very much in front of the troops, uh, very independent, and completely original in his thinking. But what I admire most of all is that he also is very courageous. Courage is also important. In maintaining your course as opinion leader, sometimes against all vested interests and mainstream thinking, and that's not easy. Without offending any colleagues in the profession, he's very elegant and very uh, gentlemanlike in that. That attitude has to do with his personality and his development as economist, a political scientist, but also as a human being in the past decades. By this uh, unique combination of three dimensions, first, broadness in social sciences, uh, economics, political science, 
in every aspect. Second, of bridging the gap between academia and the real world. And thirdly, his independence in originality and originality of his thinking. Then he has created his own school of thinking with many followers around the world, from left to right, within developed countries and developing countries, inside and outside the mainstream of economics and political science. And that's quite astonishing. He's at, he is uh, complying with all the elements Keynes always attributed to what an economist or political economist should be. Consequently, he has become one of the most prominent economic and political thinkers of this time. Before I give the floor to our keynote speaker of today, I would like to share a little anecdote with you, which occurred during the recent weeks. I love anecdotes. When the Vrienden van Kopenhagen lecture was announced, I was approached by many economists, editors of newspapers and other media in our country. Uh, countless. Because we were re restrained in the number of interviews, by time limitations, we were forced to choose two sets of newspapers, uh, which for having exclusive interviews with Danny, and had to regretfully decline the other request of newspapers and other media. What happened is typical for the fame and standing which Jenny acquired as an opinion leader in economics and political science and globalization inequality on the rights and wrongs of economic science. The other newspapers who couldn't have an interview phoned him at his Harvard office for having also exclusive interviews. On globalization, inequality, and other issues, which was quite interesting. Of course, the only two exclusive interviews, which will appear shortly, will be in the Financiële Dagblad and ASB, as a combination, respectively, het Algemeen Dagblad en het Brabants Dagblad, also in combination. So then you know that these are real exclusive interviews. You may have read some of his articles and books and interviews, but today you will hear him exclusively, real exclusively, live on stage. And therefore, I now wish to give the floor to the keynote speaker of today, Professor Danny Roderick, who will he share his thoughts with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sylvester, for a very, very kind and gracious uh, introduction. Um, it's really uh, a, a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, for these, uh, these proceedings. Uh, I, I might be a bit jet-lagged having arrived uh, uh, only, only this morning, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited uh, to be here uh, with you. Um, so uh, what I'll be, I'll be talking about is, uh, is uh, some of the ideas in this book uh, that, that came out, I guess, about uh, a, a year ago. Uh, but, but many of these issues have, have regained prominence because uh, of, the, of the, the, the backlash against um, sort of uh, established ways of thinking and, and uh, uh, e economists have never been regarded very positively by society, but certainly, uh, you know, in, 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 the rest, in, in, the, in the last year, uh, our, our credibility and, and uh, uh, and, and legitimacy ha haven't haven't improved much. Um, now, it, it's uh, it, the, the book is a, is a, is is interesting in the sense that, as, as Sylvester uh, said, uh, most of it is actually a um, a, a positive uh, evaluation uh, of economics, and and that's 
you know, for many readers, that, that's been a, a bit surprising because I've, I've, I've been known as, as a critic of, of um, you know, many economists, many sort of, uh, uh, you know, many ideas that have come out of, of economics. Uh, uh, but in, in some ways, this is, this is um, um, uh, sort of paying my debt back to the profession, if you will, of, of, of just saying, uh, just I saying that that uh, there's a lot of good things uh, in, 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 in economics as well. Uh, and I guess part of it is also due to my contrarian uh, nature, which uh, uh, I think Sylvester alluded to, which is that you know, by the time an idea such as you know, economics is, is no good, becomes conventional wisdom, uh, I, you know, I, I, I get very, um, I get very, um, uh, sort of, I, I feel that, that it's already, it's, it's a wrong idea and it needs to be, uh, needs to be uh, fought back against. So, uh, so here I'm, I'm, I'm fighting, if you will, a rear guard action to defend ec economics against its critics. Although, as you see, uh, I think, you know, some of the points that I make is really about how economics has been used in, in the public domain uh, by economists. So I, I do have my criticisms as well. Um, but I hope maybe at the end we can also tie it uh, back uh, with sort of our discussions about what's happening with globalization, popul uh, the, the populist backlash, and, and, and so forth. Um, let me begin with, um, with uh, uh, you know, probably, you know, the one time everybody hears about the economics discipline is in October when the Nobel uh, Prizes uh, are, are uh, are announced, and of course, the critis, critics of economics always say these are not real Nobel prizes, and, and there's a sense in which they are not. Uh, but uh, but that's a that's a different story. Here is, um, you know, the, the people who won who won the, the Nobel uh, uh, in economics, uh, I guess, for the last four years, um, and uh, uh, and I think this 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 really represents the best and the brightest uh, of the economics profession, and and then. Um, uh, and, and, and they present a side of the economics discipline, which actually is very different from the side that typically uh, the public sees. And I think, you know, I want to start off as to sort of what's critical and what's the, the, the absolutely wonderful thing about economics that, that these people represent that you actually don't often get from the way that you hear economics represented in public debates or whether it's inequality and globalization. Um, one thing is that, you know, somewhat paradoxically, none of them has actually contributed a very big idea. Uh, what they have done is, is, is develop f uh, sort of a, a um, collection of frameworks. Um, and so, for example, the last uh, year's winners, uh, last October, was Bank Holstrom and Oliver Hart uh, on the left at the top, and they won the Nobel for collectively for their work on contract theory, and that's really a collection of frameworks, what I will shortly call models, collection of models uh, that explain in highly stylized settings uh, how uh, you might de devise the incentive arrangements in a setting where uh, the interest of uh, what's called a principal, for example, the owner of the firm, diverges from the agents, for example, the manager of the firm. Uh, and you can apply that kind of framework with, you know, some, you know, with, with minor uh, changes to a whole lot of different things. Right next to them was as, uh, is Jean Tirol, who won the, um, uh, the prize the, the year before uh, for his work on industrial organization. What was that? Again, a collection of frameworks about how to think about issues of regulation in very different idea in different domains. Um, of whether it's sort of you know credit cards, whether it's uh, you know the railroads, or whether it's the internet, and I remember distinctly a, a journalist, uh, you know, so I think it was the New York Times interviewing Jean Tirole and asking, desperately trying to get at sort of what's the big idea here, what's the big message that's going to be the headline, French economist wins Nobel for, um, and you know, pushing him on uh, sort of what's the big idea in your work. And Jean Tirole having you know, tremendous difficulty articulating what that big idea is. And in the end, he sort of gets very you know, frustrated and says, look, there is no big, he said, you know, 
every market is different. You know, the way you would regulate the internet is different from the way that you would regulate the credit card business, from the way that you would regulate you know, the railroad industry. And what my models do is highlight some of the salient effects in different settings of these different kinds of market relationships and how re regulation might work. But you know, it's not a big idea. Similarly, Angus Deaton uh, at the very, and on, again, on the right, on the sort of, he won the, he won the Nobel for a, you know, basically empirical work in development. Again, it's a, it's a series of empirical applications um, in different settings, uh, you know, typically to rural households and their decisions on how to consume, how to save, um, uh, what to produce, and so forth. Um, no, ver no big idea, but sort of very careful empirical application that you know, tries to get at you know, some basic economic facts, such as what is, what is the price elasticity of demand uh, for rice, and how does that depend on you know, how, how big your household is or what your income level is and so forth, okay? Um, so it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a very different from the way that in, in, you know, economics is sometimes presented as you know, sort of the market, and sort of market is this wonderful thing or state intervention, or being pro or against globalization. Uh, sort of, you know, the, the models that these people developed uh, at best are, 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 are shedding just sort of partial light on these kinds of questions, but they would be the first person, they would be the first uh, to say that the, the point is not to have one big idea, one big theory, but to develop uh, different uh, sort of contextual understanding of how markets work in different kinds of settings. If you will, going back, I think this was four years ago, uh, perhaps the most paradoxical, from a public standpoint, Nobel Prize was awarded to uh, three economists working in the area of finance. I have the two of them, uh, two of them here. Uh, Eugene Fama, whose main contribution, in fact, these individually, they had a big idea. Uh, Eugene Fama's big idea was that markets are efficient. Bob Schiller, next to him, his big idea is that markets are inefficient. Okay, um, and, uh, and, and to balance it out, there was a third, uh, actually an econometrician who was trying to basically figure out which one is right. Now the point of course is that they both made critical contributions. Uh, Eugene Fama helped us understand uh, as a benchmark uh, model that the circumstances under which in fact financial markets were efficient, how, how you couldn't beat financial markets, uh, like stock markets systematically. And Bob Schiller actually developed a whole sort of developed our understanding of a whole set of circumstances under which, in fact, markets would not be efficient. There would be excessive volatility, for example, in financial markets, uh, in the way that information wasn't going to be provided very. So this, I think subtly, the message of the Nobel uh, Committee uh, in this in this prize wasn't that either one of them was the right one. It's just that depending on context, depending on time, depending on market, each one had a particularly important message, uh, but that you had to take them together. Uh, that you wouldn't, you know, if you believe that Eugene Fama was right the whole time, then you would end up in the global financial crisis as you did in 2008, okay? On the other hand, if you think Bob Schiller was right the whole time, uh, then you may not want to have financial markets at all, uh, or you might want to just, you know, have them extremely heavily regulated, okay? So, uh, so the, the, the book uh, is really about sort of how you can make sense of this, about how something, it, a science or a discipline that doesn't have big ideas, that in fact has a lot of contradictory ideas in it, um, can also be useful. Uh, the sense in which it is, that is actually a science, because what I'm describing is a very different kind of a science from the natural sciences, or the way that natural sciences think of themselves. It's actually very different from the way that often economists think of the kind of science theirs is, and I'll explain that in a second, um, and how, in fact, that might be practical and relevant and useful. Now, after I wrote the book, I came across this quote from John Maynard Keynes, and as typical, Keynes put everything much better than anybody could have put. In fact, had I seen this quote before I wrote the book, I might not have written the book, uh, because this encapsulates the message of the book uh, much better than uh, I had the ability to do so. And the quote is really, is, goes to the heart of the matter. Economics is the science of thinking in terms of, model, of models joined to the art of choosing models which are relevant. So you need two things. You need the model to discipline your thinking, and those are going to be highly stylized frameworks. Um, 
And then second, you need what he called the art, uh, or what in fact I, I, you know, I talk in the book as the craft, uh, of figuring out uh, which is the relevant model to the setting at hand. Okay? So the art and the craft, but you know, it's not exactly purely judgment calls. We have a lot of techniques, we have you know, empirical techniques that actually allow us to do that. Economists, one of the main messages, econo e economists are extremely good at developing these models, extremely bad at choosing the models that are relevant. And I think this is where we go wrong in practice, okay? Now, uh, a few years back, actually this was back in the early 1970s, uh, there was a, 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 an economist um, uh, who might be well known here, um, who, was a, who wrote this mock ethnography, Axel Leonhofer uh, wrote this mock ethnography about sort of the, uh, the tribe, the econ tribe as he called them, um, and uh, that, that highlighted uh, back in the 1970s the critical role uh, that models played. He called them sort of models. Okay? Status of the adult male is determined by his skill at making the model of his fields. Status is achieved only by making models. And most of these, he didn't have a very high opinion of models, so he's, the message that I'm going to give you is different, but he said, uh, most of these models seem to be of little or no practical use, and that accounts for the backwardness and abject cultural poverty of the tribe, okay? Um, he stressed uh, that, um, that, that basically models determined everything, the status in the profession, it also determined how S economists think about other social scientists. So for example, he says that uh, in, ex in explaining to a stranger, for example, why a member of this tribe, the econ tribe, holds the sociogs or the pole size in such low regard, the econ will say they do not make models and leave it at that. Now, of course, this is a lot less true today than it used to be at the time, but it's still a very clear dividing line between who is afforded status and uh, standing. Uh, among economists and who doesn't? Do you make models? Are you, you know, basically, are you expressing yourself with models? He also, the other thing that, that Leon Hofert stressed is that in fact there are different models. That the economics is really a, a collection of different models and also got to the heart of one problem that I'll highlight, uh, which is that people get excessively attached to their own models. So the micro people are attached to the micro model, uh, the macro people to the macro model. Now, some of these distinctions are not very relevant today given the discipline has, has, uh, has, has changed, but I think some of these parochial attachments are still, are still the case. Now, so models are highly stylized uh, simplifications. Um, and you may want to think of them sort of one parallel, as you want me to think of them as, as sort of a, a map. So if you're leaving your house and you're going to get somewhere and then um, uh, a map will allow you how to get there. Um, and in fact, that particular analogy uh, is, is, uh, is used in what is probably, you know, the shortest short story ever written, which is also the most effective piece of uh, philosophy of science I've ever read. And, and this is from uh, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, and this is the entire story, uh, one paragraph. Uh, I won't let you, you can, you can read it while I explain you what it says. So it's basically, it says that there was this empire a long time ago where the cartographer, in, the cartographer, the map makers in the empire were so uh, dedicated to perfection that they made these incredibly detailed maps. So the map of, a pr uh, of the empire was as large as the size of a province. A map of the province was as large as the size of a city. And pretty soon they got dissatisfied even with that. So they started to draw maps that were one-to-one, -one, exact size of the area they were drawing. And then um, then he relates in the same of the story. I mean, you know, it takes longer to <laughs> explain what the story is than would to read it. But he says, later generations found absolutely no use for these. So then, you know, basically uh, the map, uh, these maps were found in sort of discarded in the desert because nobody could use them. The whole point is that what gives power, to, what gives maps their power and their usefulness is precisely that they are 
stylized abstractions, simplifications of the reality. That if you actually try to get every detail right, if you made these maps one to one, they would lose all their usefulness. Okay? So extremely important point that you can never legitimately criticize a model because for its being simple, because simplicity is its virtue, the whole point, it's a bug. It's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, you can criticize on other domains as I'm going to do it, but the you know, sort of first line sort of criticism of economics or the economic approach, which is that it's based on highly stylized simplifications of reality, is not a legitimate criticism at all, and the answer for that, uh, I think, is, is given uh, in this quote. Now, but going on with the map analogy, the kind of map that you're going to need when you step out of your house depends very much on where you're going and, and what kind of, of uh, vehicle you're going to use. If you're going to be traveling by subway, you want a subway map. If you're going to have, uh, you're going to on, on your bike, you know, you want a map that shows the bike paths. If you're going to go, you know, travel, you know, to another city with your car, you want the highway map. If you're going to be walking, you want the, the walking map. And if you take the wrong map, it's not going to be very useful, okay? So there are alternative ways of simplifying, alternative uh, stylized uh, simplifications, and it's going to be very critical to know which map uh, you're taking with you, uh, and that's really the, the second half of, of, of economics. Now, so, uh, the argument, just, models, in fact, are a key to the scientific nature of economics, uh, and what they do is they help us understand complex social reality by laying bare a very large variety of causal relationships one at a time, okay? So the virtue of a model is it highlights one of these relationships at a time. Second, and I think this is a point that, that economists miss, and I think this gets us into mischief the whole time, uh, economists have this notion of, uh, of, of um, their science as one where it develops vertically. You start with a bad model, you test it, you improve it, it becomes better. You test it again, you tweak it, it becomes even better. And then vertically over time, you're attaining perfection with the best model. I think this is the wrong way of thinking about economics and what models do precisely because social reality is so varied over time, space, and context. No model can actually be perfect at best it's one that can identify the relevant relationships in a particular setting. And what that means is that models are really, economics is really an inventory at best, or it's, a, it's a library of partial explanations, each one of them non-universal, each one of them context specific. So it, economics therefore as a science develops not vertically by having an ever uh, improving uh, set of models the, with the later ones replacing the older ones, but in fact horizontally by having more and more models that explain the complex social reality or, 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 or new things that were not explained uh, before. Okay? And I would argue that if you think of economics in the way that I've just explained it, uh, that this would counter uh, uh, most uh, critiques of, of economics, uh, as well as, by the way, as I said, economists' own description of what is it that they do, okay? And here is the problem. The reason that I think in practice we run into trouble, we have a lousy reputation, uh, is that we often end up developing excessive, um, excessive attachments to a particular model. We forget that it's a model. We treat it as the model. Uh, and, uh, and, and we don't spend enough time thinking about how we navigate among these models, figuring out which of these models are the one uh, relevant one. When do we use Fama? When do we use Schiller? Okay? So, let me just go you know, a little bit, um, you know, scratch a little bit uh, uh, the surface of how economics works, because if you're not an economist, or if all you've done in economics is do economics 101, uh, the introductory course in economics, you might think that economics is a set of, you know, predestined conclusions. For example, that government intervention always reduces inefficiency of the markets. Or, for example, that, you know, raising the minimum wage is going to reduce uh, employment levels. Okay? 
This is not, in fact, how economics works. In economics, the answer is always, it depends. And what these models do is they tell you what it depends on. Okay? So you might say, how could a science that where the answer is always it depends, how could it be possibly useful? Well, it's useful because it tells you what it depends on. And knowing what it depends on actually gives you a way of checking reality against what it depends on and figuring out, in fact, whether the model you're using uh, is a relevant one or not. Okay? So let's take about you know, some, some questions uh, in, that we might want to ask economists. What's the effect of minimum wage on employment? What's the effect of expansionary fiscal policy on economic activity? What's the effect of capital flows and economic growth in a developing country? What's the effect of trade liberalization on economic performance around the world? And you can imagine a whole bunch of running the list of all these sort of policy relevant, highly germane questions, which you know, we would want uh, economists to answer for us. Uh, the answer to each one of these, an economist who's being honest to his or her discipline will tell you the answer to each one of these is it depends, but I can tell you more. It depends, I'll tell you, you know, what it depends on. Different models produce different results, okay? And just to give you just the, the, the simplest example here, okay, let's take the minimum wage example. What are the employment consequences of a minimum wage imposed by the government? Everybody who's taken any economics has seen this, the cross, supply and demand, competitive market in labor markets. There's an equilibrium with an equilibrium wage level. So if the government doesn't intervene, there is no wage floor. You know, there's a, a wage rate and an equilibrium level of employment in this market. So the government says, no, I don't like this equilibrium wage. I'm going to raise uh, the wage level to this floor. And so it raises the minimum wage to that level. What would happen? Employment level will decline because uh, people who demand in firms and establishments facing now a higher wage will reduce their demand for employment and therefore employment level will fall. If you take one, Econ 101, this is the only thing that you will know about and you will think that econ economics is a definite answer to the question about what's the effect of the minimum wage on employment. Okay? But what, says, what does it say at the very bottom? A competitive market. What is it that I've assumed here? I'm assuming that the market is a competitive one. But in particular, that there are a lot of employers out there, each of whom is really competing to hire workers. Now let me, let me just change that assumption and instead think about what an economist calls a monopsonistic market. It's like a monopolistic market, except that the, you know, the market power is not on the, in the, on the side of a seller of good, but on the buyer of a service, in this case, a buyer of labor services. So think of a local labor market where there's a large retail establishment that actually has some market power. In, a, in other words, it can actually, uh, by choosing how many workers it employs, it can affect the local wage level. So it's a relatively large employer. So in this case, we're not no longer dealing with a perfectly competitive market. We're dealing with something that's more like monopsonistic. Then the equilibrium in this market is going to be driven by very different considerations. I'm not going to you know, run you through the mechanics of this, but I'll just assert the conclusion of this model, which is that if I actually put a minimum wage in this market, as long as it's not too high, I will actually get an increase in employment in this market, not a decrease. Diametrically oppo opposite result. Intuitively, the result for this, the reason for this, is that in the monopsonistic market where employers are behaving strategically to keep the wage costs low, if you now prevent them from doing that by keeping, giving them a minimum wage floor, they no longer have any ability to control wages, and therefore they act as if they were competitive. And that, that actually increases their employment level. Okay? Diametrically opposite results depending on what you assume about the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the nature of the market. Is this a curiosum? It's not. There is a huge discussion in the American context where minimum wage issues are still very alive. What's this level? Should we have one or not? Uh, whether in fact, it's the 
left picture or the right one that is the relevant one. So we have a lot of empirical results that look at the effect of minimum wages in different local labor markets in the United States, and often they produce the result on the right kind, of the one in the right panel. You put a minimum wage on employment, either employment doesn't change or employment level rises. Okay? So maybe it's the, monopolist, the, monop the monopsonistic model that applies there. You can apply this kind of this, and I've just given you one policy question with two different models, and, and it just runs through the entire discipline of economics. It, it always depends, okay? Um, it was a, um, one of my intellectual heroes uh, is, is Carlos Diaz Alejandro, uh, a Cuban-born economist, uh, international economist who passed a, a long time ago, but you know, one thing he wrote, I think this was back in the 1980s, he said, by now, and he said, this was 1980, he said, by now, any graduate student, by picking his, his assumptions appropriately, can produce any policy conclusion he or she wants in economics, okay? Now, that doesn't make that policy conclusion the right one. The point of producing that is that it makes it explicit exactly what that conclusion actually hinges on, and therefore leaves that conclusion challengeable on the basis of whether the critical assumptions that derive that conclusion uh, hold in the real world or not. Right. Now we can think of, you know, I'm going to give you two different ways of thinking about economic models, which I think in terms of the re rhetorical value of models, uh, they're powerful. One is that you can think about economic models as actually fables or little uh, parables. Uh, they are very simple. Uh, they're explicitly not real, artificial. They have a very clear storyline, so you can remember what, what you can have, th what they, they, the story they sell. They have a very uh, a transparent moral uh, about what the outcome is. And you have a different fable or different parable for every situation. You know, sometimes you know, saving a lot is a good thing, sometimes saving a lot is a bad thing. You have parables about both. And the same about uh, economic models. Alternative, you can think of economic models as experiments. Now, this might seem puzzling because, you know, from stories to experiments, from one extreme of, you know, sort of non-scientificity to, to, to another extreme, but actually, models are experiments. Uh, they are thought experiments, uh, but they have many aspects that are similar. So, what does a lab experiment do? It, lab experiment, isolates effect of a specific cause or intervention. So if you want to isolate the effect you're looking at from the interference from air pressure, you conduct the experiment in a vacuum. And the same with a uh, econ economist model. You abstract away from complications so that you can clarify causal links. Okay. Um, The same also with, with questions about extrapolation. So every time you do an experiment and you want to think about how it would apply in the real world, you need to think about other, other, other conditions that might interfere with the extrapolation. And the same with sort of model, the way that you apply to the real world. Okay? Let me talk about a couple of things that often, uh, you know, people, when people think about models, uh, they, obs they, they obsess about that I think are, are really the side issue, not the core of it. One is the role of math. Most, most models in economics are mathematical. They're explicitly stated in the language of mathematics. But it doesn't mean that the math is actually critical to the model. One of the best modelers of all time uh, was Tom Schelling, my former colleague at the Kennedy School who recently passed, um, got the Nobel Prize in, in game theory. Uh, and he expressed all his models in verbally. Um, now, I never understood the genius in his models until they were explained to me with math. Um, and, and this is why I say that you know, economists use math not because they are smart, but because they're not smart enough. Um, and I think the point of the math is to make sure that you understand exactly what the result is and also that exactly what it hinges on. So what, because when we use math, we're not, you know, it, it's not a special skill that gives sort of, you know, special powers. It just allows us to make sure 
that we are explicit about the nature of our assumptions, about the, you know, the, the relationships and the conclusions. It's really about clarity and consistency, nothing more. Yeah? It's nothing more fancy than that. Uh, but I often find, uh, partly because I'm not so smart, but I guess that you know, you know, even people smarter than I am would have the same problem, sometimes I think the intuition of, of a particular uh, uh, explanation is pretty clear. If I don't express it in the language of a formal mathematical model, and when I do, I often find that I'm missing something. I'm missing a critical assumption that has to be there for my intuition. And so the, the, the math helps me get it. Um, second, uh, you know, often we think about eco you know, the, the economics working in a model where everybody is hyper-rational and completely self-interested. Okay? Actually, neither feature is critical to economics, and, um, and, and both can be relaxed. So it's really a side issue. Uh, third, um, very important point about sort of the assumptions. It is in the very nature of modeling that you have to have unrealistic assumptions. Every time you're abstracting away from some feature of the world to create a simplified model, uh, you are um, uh, producing some unrealistic assumptions. And I think Milton Friedman um, tried to assume that, uh, tried to argue, um, saying that basically relevance of the model had nothing to do uh, with the realism of the assumptions. Uh, I wouldn't go that far, but I would say that what's really critical, what's really important was, it, was whether the critical assumptions uh, um, are true or not. And the difference between all assumptions and the critical assumption is that a change in the critical assumption would change, uh, you know, moving the critical assumption in the direction of making it more realistic uh, would actually change the result in a substantive way. Not changing all assumptions need not do it in that way. That's, let me just skip that. So uh, when I say, you know, when I say that, that um, e economics is really sort of these models are making uh, a, a, a economics uh, a, a science or a scientific discipline, uh, what exactly do, am I, do, do I have in mind? One is, is, is the point that I've, I've um, kept stressing, which is that models allow us to be ex extremely clear and transparent about uh, the nature of uh, the story we're telling, about the hypothesis, the, the causal chains. Uh, second, um, having models, having these abstract models help us precisely select which one of these partial explanations may be the more relevant one in a given setting. We can do it after the fact through formal statistical or empirical tools, or we can do it in real time uh, and that sort of would be like applied policy analysis with having these, you know, each one of these stylized models have different implications, different assumptions. We can test them in, 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 you know, uh, in, in, in informally against the, against, uh, against the real world and decide. Third, very important uh, is, is, and this is a feature of economics that I think is extremely important that often many other social sciences lack, which is it's really, it's a method of sorting out disagreements. Uh, it's a difference between uh, arguments that can, can be shown to be wrong versus those in the, in the famous phrasing of, of Pauli, Wolfgang Pauli, arguments that, that are not even wrong in the sense that, that you don't even know how you disprove them because they are stated in such loose, informal way. So even when two economists don't agree, they know exactly what it is that they're not agreeing on. And oftentimes, what is it that they're not agreeing on may be something that relates to the real world and that can be formally or informally tested. For example, the magnitude of the elasticity of labor supply. If you think the elasticity of la labor supply is very low, then you wouldn't care too much about high tax rates. And you would think that as long as high tax rates provide a lot of resources for transfers that would be good for equity without very negative consequences for efficiency. If the labor supply elasticity is very large, then you worry a lot about the incentive effects of high taxes. You would worry that a lot of people would be dropping out of the labor market or working less, so there would be high price to pay for more equity or for more redistribution. So there we are, 
what appears to be a very significant ideological uh, uh, disagreement between the left wing and the right wing in economic policy and economics actually boils down to one very specific parameter in a model, okay? which can in principle be estimated. Um, and, and finally, sort of the point about the, uh, the accumulation uh, of, of knowledge, uh, which is that, uh, that it, it's, it's really, uh, it's, it's a horizontal accumulation. That when you think about how our understanding of the way markets work, it hasn't developed because better models have, devel have replaced worse ones. You know, we had the, you know, the perfectly competitive model that was the one that uh, Adam Smith was talking about. Then that perfectly competitive model was taken and we added features of imperfect competition like monopoly or oligopoly, but that didn't replace the perfectly competitive model because some models are you know, some, some markets are more akin to perfectly competitive than imperfectly competitive. Then we took those imperfectly competitive models and said, ah, maybe there's asymmetries of information too. So then we developed models of asymmetric information, but those models of asymmetric information did not displace the models of imperfect competition or models of perfect competition because there are markets where asymmetric inf information don't matter. So you need all those models and you will, sometimes you'll apply one, sometimes you'll apply the other, okay? Now, sometimes, the, you know, one of the good things that has happened uh, in the economics discipline on the last, ever since I, actually I got my PhD, is that it's becoming much more empirical. And, and doing things empirically really leaves much less room for ideology, because the empirics discipline, the kind of conclusions uh, you, can, you can derive. Now, there's a temptation within the economics profession these days to actually say, well, now our empirical tools have developed so much. It's not just our fancy econometrics and statistical tools, but we are now have all these big data that we can use to develop answers. So why theory? Why need theory? Why need this formal framework? Why these, need these models at all? We don't need them at all. Let the, let the facts speak for themselves. Um, I think this is actually the wrong way of thinking uh, in the social sciences because facts never speak for themselves. You're always interpreting them through some frame. And it's much better to do it explicitly rather than, than, uh, than, than uh, informally. Uh, on Twitter, somebody I don't know actually gave me the perfect example of that, uh, which was that, that he mentioned, if you, if you toss a coin 10 times and nine times out of 10, it comes up heads. You look at this and say, that's a surprise. Are the facts speaking to here? Well, why is it it's a surprise? Because you had a prior expectation that this coin was fair. You have a model of a fair coin, and if you toss a fair coin 10 times, on average, it'll come out five times heads, five times tails. So there's an implicit model that you're applying to that the simplest of facts, how many times it comes up heads or tails. But in the absence of that, what do you make of that? You don't know. Uh, so every fact requires an interpretive frame. And I think our obsession with big data and a lot of statistical techniques often ignores that without even getting into the question how you would actually uh, um, extrapolate uh, any finding from a particular locale to somewhere else. And that always needs modeling. All right. Um, there are a lot of uh, different approaches. I said that, that the critical thing to use these models intelligently is going to be uh, to figure out when you apply one model as opposed to another. When do you apply Fama? When do you apply Schiller? When do you apply the monopsalistic labor market model? When do you apply the perfectly competitive labor market model? Economists actually have a lot of formal and informal ways of doing that. And um, I, I've listed some of these uh, here. Uh, getting into them probably would, would become too technical and would be, would be too boring. But the point is that, that we have a lot of techniques for navig navigating across these, these models. The, the striking thing is that, that you know, in economics, we rarely systematically teach these techniques. The, 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 uh, the approach to focus uh, tends to be in undergraduate classes, in the basic competitive model with all the benchmark results, 
So you get a very misleading view uh, about the diversity of uh, results within economics. And in graduate school, if you're a PhD student, you do basically all the latest models, the, the ones that are, you know, the, the, the latest fad or the fashion. Um, um, and, and we don't actually do um, a, a good job of teaching our students uh, about the value of this diversity and the need to think about both formally and informally how to uh, navigate this. Um, in my own work, uh, I, I, I tend to do a lot of work on economic growth in the context of developing countries. And doing that work is always trying to navigate different models of economic growth. You know, going to you know, Ethiopia, is, you know, which model is the relevant growth model for Ethiopia? Is it a neoclassical model where I would look at physical and human capital? Is it the endogenous growth model where it's all about R&D and product market competition? Is it a trade and growth model? Is it a dual economy model? Is it a structuralist model? Is it the institutionalist model? Each one gives sort of a different focus and therefore a different priority for policies. Yeah. It's always the, 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 the work of an applied uh, policy economist is always to, to, to navigate among, across these, in, these, these different types of models and figure out which one uh, um, uh, it, it captures the, the most relevant features. So now, let me draw back and, and sort of you know, um, uh, begin to wrap up uh, by um, using sort of the set of arguments that I've developed, uh, although I've sort of only scratched the surface, uh, to, to confront some of the, uh, some of the criticisms uh, that, that, uh, ec uh, that ec ec economics is under. Okay? Uh, for example, for something I mentioned from, from, the, begin from, the, uh, from the outset, the notion that, that so much of economics is really about developing these simplistic reductionist theories, uh, this is a feature, it's not a bug. The problem only comes when you treat a model as the model. So you treat the latest model or an established benchmark model as the only one that could, could be applied. Um, economists are always or are often criticized for reifying markets and material incentives. Okay? But this is not really true in the context of the, of the diversity of, economic, of models that exist in economics. Economics is criticized for having conservative market-oriented bias. Again, it's not clear. There are many, many more models of how government intervention can make things better, not just for equity, but also efficiency, than there are market, than models that actually show markets are efficient. So I could just you know, run, run through this, uh, through this, this, this list, um, and I think many of these, these, uh, these, these criticisms are actually not particularly relevant uh, to the way that, that economics in the seminar room uh, is, is, is practice. I think, you know, this is not to say that, that there aren't severe problems with economics, but I think they, 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 they originate less from the economics of the discipline than from the sociology uh, of the discipline, if you will. Uh, that, you know, one, you know, syndrome is what I've kept stressing is, is sort of mistaking a model for the model syndrome, that you, you expect model that worked in one segment will always going to work all the time. So you, you overlook alternative models. So for example, very critically, uh, in the run-up to the uh, global financial crisis, there was excessive focus in policy discussions on models where financial markets were efficient and in models where the ability of the government regulation to improve efficiency and incentives in financial markets were very limited. Okay? So you, get, you had too much pharma, too little Schiller. Um, and that also uh, is not only gets the policy conclusion wrong, it also leads to overconfidence. It leads to hubris. I think one reason that economists lost confidence is not only that uh, they may have been occasionally wrong, but it's also the confidence with which they have uttered those conclusions have been overstated uh, in line of uh, the diversity of, 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 of models within their own profession. Um, second approach is, you know, I've, I've emphasized, you know, this diversity, but in practice, often economists are going to exhibit a categorical preference for certain assumptions or certain axioms. So you don't need to have rational households and investors, but typically, you know, 
economists will tend to you know, exhibit a preference for these you know, rational and forward-looking individuals in the way they think about markets, even when they may not be relevant. Third is, is you know, looking for the keys, where the light is, as opposed to where you might have dropped them. Uh, I think that's sort of in, in, in the nature of, 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 of economics, is that, that you, you tend to prefer questions for analysis that are amenable to, your, to the tools of analysis you have. Uh, so uh, often you miss out some of the big issues in the way that, for example, in the discussion on globalization, many of the distributional questions or many questions about social norms or social dumping in trade uh, were, uh, were uh, ignored by economists uh, because that wasn't uh, sort of, there was an immediate uh, relationship to the kinds of tools that, that they had developed. And one of the things that, that I find extremely problematic is, is what I call this problem of implicit political economy theorizing in policy discussions, which is to say that, that, that economists will often invo involve themselves in a political debate by taking sides and on the basis of a very poorly developed implicit political economy argument. Again, globalization. Um, in the globalization debate, economists mostly acted as cheerleaders for globalization, mostly uh, pro favored trade deals. Now, they knew very well, because it's in standard trade theory, that globalization and trade deals provide, produce not just winners, but they also produce a lot of losers. This you know, should not have been a surprise because it's in the standard uh, comparative advantage, standard trade theory models that they teach. In fact, the benchmark models of comparative advantage have very stark distributional consequences from opening up to trade and from globalization. So it's built in into these models. But economists would emphasize the efficiency gains, that the size of the pie would be larger. They would say very little about distribution. And if the distributional issues came up, they would say, uh, you know, uh, you can deal with it in other ways, or it's unlikely to be big. In the long run, everybody can gain. It's not good for the government to not, you know, sort of interfere here just for equity. And when you scrutinize that, why they were doing that, uh, you know, the argument would be that, well, you don't want to feed the barbarians. You don't want to provide ammunition to the barbarians. Who are the barbarians? The barbarians were the protectionists, who would be basically taking these nuances, uh, the caveats, and use it for their own protectionist um, uh, um, ends. It's as if, you know, if you had a distribution of the barbarians, they were basically asymmetric on only one side of the issue. As if there weren't any barbarians on the other, as if, you know, there weren't, you know, sort of pharmaceutical companies, you know, were abusing, you know, intellectual property rights rules in, in trade deals, as if there weren't any multinationals who were abusing these trade agreements to, to get one-sided legal, so they are barriers. So it was very, you know, poor political economy on their part to sort of, you know, think that, and, and this, this, in the end, uh, I think, came to haunt economists because I think a big reason why we as economists lost credibility in this debate is because we came to be viewed as a, uh, as a party to the debate, as, as, as sort of, you know, on the bank, you know, having joined the bandwagon for globalization cheerleaders, as opposed to the group that was speaking truth to power, that is sort of, sort of laying out the trade-offs and explaining the likely consequences. And if we had done that, maybe we would have had more credibility today when now we are in fact seeing the barbarians, so to speak, having hijacked the process because in fact, many of the things that are being said today about trade by nativists and populists are downright false. But when economists are not speaking against those things, uh, it's not getting any traction. It's not getting traction because I think we've lost uh, credibility. So uh, let, me just, um, let me just end here by sort of saying that, that, saying that you, know, you have diverse viewpoints, that economists is a portfolio of models, that all kinds of different conclusions are possible uh, is not a weakness of economics. Uh, it's actually a strength that by saying these things, you're actually closer to discipline than by actually by, by taking just one-sided view. Um, uh, and I, I think it's also sort of the best response that an economist uh, can have uh, to criticism from the outsiders who are to say, but, you, but you're not taking this factor into account, you're ignoring this. The best answer to that is to say, okay, 
let's model that too. Um, and I think you know this is this is this this is this is the right time. Finally, um, I think thinking about economics inherently as this portfolio, I think also makes us more modest and and gives us greater humility in the way that we approach uh, public uh, uh, public problems and engage the, the public debate, uh, which is something that we economists can use. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Danny, for this wonderful lecture, which makes us uh, humble again, and even more humble than before. Uh, and uh, your speech was not only, thank you very much, was not only about economics or political economy, it was also about social sciences in general. Social sciences should uh, realize that it always depends on. And uh, we have some time for uh, questions, Q&A. However, we are constrained by time because we have also the scholarship and prize. Uh, that means that we have some 15 minutes. I would ask you if you want to take the floor for a question. First, to introduce yourself. Second, uh, which institution you represent and, so, and thirdly, that you constrain yourself to at least one or two sentences in terms of question and not a monologue. Please. <coughs> Nobody? Yeah? Well. Oh, here, here. Here, yeah, sorry, here. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. And maybe you can stand up. Yeah? Um, my name is Theo Kokken. Uh, I'm a part time professor at the VU in Amsterdam. I graduated at this nice university and in the past. Um, and my question is. Um, I'm more or less uh, fighting for uh, more pluralist economics. And you said, well, economics is already uh, quite diverse and pluralist. Uh, but um, if you look at the mainstream, what we get taught, in general, it's still very um, based on very strong assumptions about human behavior, rationality, uh, especially in, in finance, in my area of risk management. Uh, and I think what we get taught at the universities is not helpful it's too homogeneous and too limited in um, what they're teaching. And so we are with, together with people in the UK, uh, but also here in the Netherlands, we think in economics, we try to change education for more diversity. And my question is, um, here's the question, what do you think about, uh, I mean, you, you, research is diverse and there are lots of different people, lots of different models, um, but do you think that the average um, educational program is diverse enough? Yeah, great question. I, I think, the, and the answer is is no. Um, I, I think the problem is is that um, is that you 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 get a sense of that diversity much much later once you get to be a graduate student and you're a doctoral student, and that's when you 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 know you, that 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 conclusion dawns on you. Uh, but if you take just the first year or the first couple of years, then it tends to be that we we teach just the benchmark model. So you teach you know you teach how markets are efficient how comparative advantage works. And, and in a sense, you can understand you know, the, 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 re the reasoning beyond that, because those are, you know, the, you know, the discipline's crown jewels are these counterintuitive notions to the average person on the street. Imagine this chaos of a market where everybody's acting just to maximize their own self-interest, and there's no government apparently anywhere. Of course, there has to be a government to enforce contracts, protect property rights, but that's sort of you know, in the back somewhere. In, imagine in that sort of apparent chaos that the market produces efficiency. Incredible. We're very proud of that result, so we want to show students about this result. Imagine that you're, you know, two countries are trading with <coughs> each other, and one country can produce every good more expensively than the other country. 
and yet they can profitably trade with each other. Both countries end up in the aggregate better off. Could there be a more you know, counterintuitive result compared with the, the, the principle of comparative advantage? We're so proud of that. These are our, our crown jewels. We want to share with them. But in the process, you know, we either we run out of time you know, when we want to say, okay, by the way, this result really depends on a whole bunch of auxiliary assumptions, many of which are actually violated in the real world, and let's think about what happens when each one of these might be violated. We never have any time to get there. Or we've internalized the importance of these results so much as teachers that we even don't think those auxiliary assumptions matter. So either of those two, then the student, particularly undergraduate student, uh, a student who gets limited exposure to economics, which is going to be 95% of everybody who studies economics, I think gets a very misleading, uh, I think. So we definitely have to uh, do a better job of, of, of doing that teaching. I'd be the first one to admit that I don't know exactly how to do that. Because I know that by the time you get students to understand the principle of comparative advantage, you know, you've already spent a lot of you know, time on it. So I, 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 I'm totally with you with the spirit of the question that, that we, you know, we don't do the undergraduate teaching right. There's a version of your question which is about whether diversity in economics and teaching also should include you know, non-neoclassical models. And uh, that's a tougher question. And, and, I, I, and um, so let me not get into it. But I think the, I think I, th I think the, the, the main the main thing is that we oh, yeah, you know yeah, we yeah, are yeah, yeah. the main answer to your question is <clears throat> we economists are are our worst enemies because when we expose the students with what the, you know, our field is or when we expose the media or politicians and policymakers with what our field is we give a very distorted view of what discipline is and then we run into trouble. Thank you. Next question. Oh, there's a gentleman there, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Michael Leach. I'm a doctoral student at the law faculty. Um, quick question following on the education theme. Um, what, would you be able to elaborate on what the implication or ramifications for the teaching of economics um, would be if you're correct in saying that the selection and application of models is an art form rather than a science in and of itself. Uh, could you repeat that last sentence? Oh, I said, could yeah. you elaborate more on what the ramifications would yeah. be for the teaching of economics by if, if, you know, if, if you're right in saying that the, because a, a key aspect of your talk is saying that the selection application of models is, is what we're doing wrong or we're treating it wrong. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could sort of, if it, that is an art form rather than a science, then what does that mean for the way that we teach economics? Thank you. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, first you have to teach, you know, the variety, at least give the student a sense of the variety of models. And then you say, okay, in the real world, how are you going to be selecting those? Um, and there was a slide which I went through very, very quickly. And, and the way you do that is, is, is basically by, um, uh, you know, sort of thinking, uh, you know, what would you be seeing in the real world? Uh, if a, a model, if the model A as opposed to model B applied. So let me give you, a, instead of talking conceptually, let me give you a, 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 a practical um, a real world example. So when you look at a country, a you go to a developing country, there's a very low investment rate. Uh, private sector isn't investing. And you say, you know, this is a problem, why? Uh, and, and immediately there are two models that, that uh, might occur to you. One model says that the reason that, that uh, investment low is because there aren't enough savings in the economy. It's a savings driven. So the problem is on the, on the supply of savings side. There is not enough saving uh, and therefore uh, you know, people cannot invest. The second model says no, the problem is actually on the investment demand side. People don't want to invest. They may not want to invest because their property rights are very, you know, not well protected, the government is corrupt, their taxes are very high. Whatever reason, the reason is on the investment demand side rather than the, on the investment supply side. Two very different models. Obviously, you, you know, your policy solution will be very different. The moment you've stated this, informed, you know, you've developed these two models, 
then you have a whole series of formal and informal tests you can carry out, whether it's one or the other. For example, if it's the savings constraint model, it's like, you suppose this, you know, like a, you know, a, a solo kind of a class, you know, neoclassical growth model, then you should see low investment and high interest rates because it's, you know, savings are constrained. People want to invest, but there isn't enough savings. Therefore, there should be relatively high interest rates. Whereas in the other case, it's investment demand that's binding, then you're actually going, people don't want to invest, so they don't demand a lot of funds from the banking system, and from, so interest rates will be low. Immediately, you have one, two models have generated model-driven implications that give you a way of figuring out whether it's one or the other. Another example in the same kind of setting. If it is the saving, you know, if, if investment is uh, constrained by saving, uh, if for exogenous reason this economy receives a lot of transfers from abroad, for example, its commodity terms of trade improve, there's a resource discovery, or a lot of remittances come in, all of a sudden you're relaxing the saving constraint because a lot of money coming from abroad, then you should see a very strong investment response because you've listed the, the saving con constraint. But if the problem was on the investment demand side, with the same shocks, the economy will respond very differently. You'll see consumption increasing because a lot of money comes from abroad. People don't want to invest. They'll simply consume more. Okay? So immediately, so you can look at the recent experience of the country and say when there's had an increase in, in, in commodity booms or in terms of trade or capital inflows coming, coming in, which way did the country behave in? Uh, and so this way of thinking, uh, doing the diagnostics of figuring out which model is the more relevant one, you can apply across the board in all kinds of, of, of models and across all kinds of, of policy issues. And in each case, is sort of asking question, what does the model imply about the pattern of correlations in the data? And look for differences in those patterns and then see either formally or informally whether they, they hold in the data or not. I hope that that sort of was responsive to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Yeah, a student. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Oh, there. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, my name yeah. is uh, Harm. I'm an alumni of uh, the university. Oh. And what you were okay. saying here is that um, you have all those different kinds of models. And I think what we see in real life is that people pick the model they like. What I'm just wondering about, like, okay, if we have our policymakers, they have to pick the right model. They will pick the one that they like. Will there be a way for e economics to really support our policymakers, or will it just always be a fight between different views? Well, I mean, my hope would be that, that you know, economists would be honest to their profession and say, if the critical assumptions on which the model that the pol policymaker has chosen is, you know, you know, vastly at variance with reality that, you know, the, the economics profession would say, um, look, you know, this is the wrong model because of A, B, and C, you know, for, for the kind of reasons that I just cited, that the, you know, that the critical assumptions, you know, are, or the implications of the model aren't consistent with what we observe. Now, often, of course, it's not that clear cut. And then what's going to happen is, is some people are going to say, no, the labor supply elasticity is very high. Other people will say, no, it is very low. And you know, there'll be disagreement of views. Even then, what I would want to see is economists, rather than converging on some prior understanding of what's the politically correct thing to say, that they reflect those disagreements in public so that what the public hears is not what appears to be a consensus. Uh, in fact, they hear precisely the divergence of views that in turn reflects the true uncertainty in the economics profession about the value of a parameter or the value of, of, of uh, you know, the relevance of one model as opposed to the other. Because then what the public gets is a true um, um, reflection of the uncertainty uh, about which model applies. And often, maybe most often, the truth will be that we actually don't know. We're making decisions in uncer under uncertainty. But better to give the public a sense that that's what's being done, then have this you know, sort of prior consensus, either because of this kind of implicit political economy theorizing uh, um, I, I, uh, I, I, I talked about, or because of a sense that you know, polit politicians don't want you know, two-handed economists, they just want a one-handed economist. Well, are they willing to say we just don't know? 
Well, you know, that's, you know, that's, you know, if you can't say, I don't know, you cannot be a scientist. Yeah. Well, politicians, okay. no, okay. politicians, you know, they can't, they, you know, politicians, but that's a different role. You know, it's, it's completely, you know, justified for a politician to say, I think this is how the world works. You know, I, you know, I think this is what is going to make uh, everything better. Uh, it's not even contingent on the politician to be explicit about what the model underlying that view is. Uh, you know, hopefully there is a consistent view, but it's not the you know, politician's view to articulate that model. Uh, but it's, it's, I think it's incumbent on, on economists to A, articulate that model, and B, have views on its relevance. Okay. Thank you very much. Big applause for Daniel Roder. Danny, also on uh, our behalf, I'd like to thank you very much. Um, of course, you said a lot of interesting things and a lot of food for thought. Um, I myself take, have two takeaways. Probably a big part of this group is economist from profession or from study, like myself. And the other half is not. And probably what I see as today, you make a big split. Because we economists now have to re-study, re-evaluate everything we have been teached. Because we always thought there was only one model which will create all solutions. And secondly, the not economist among us will win today. Because from the past, we as economists always thought we are right. Because we understand mathematics and the rest of the school in this university does not understand mathematics. So we know the truth. But as you said, we now, as of today, we need to be quite humble. So probably as of uh, this afternoon, half of this group will look down at us economists. So thank you for that. <laughs> but I'd like to give you some special... Uh, well, we are very honored by you having here, giving your first Freedom of Copenhagen lecture. This is typical uh, Tilburg kind of uh, uh, drink. And probably most economists as of today need this more than ever <laughs> when they need to answer that question, that last question, if you don't know anymore which model to apply. Thank you. And a typical university sweater. So thank you once thank again. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, we now come to the, the next stage of uh, this program. That is the, uh, the announcement of the so-called Vrienden of Copenhagen Scholarship and the Vrienden of Copenhagen Prize, which we have introduced as of today for the best bachelor student and the best master thesis. So from a bachelor point of view, it is about giving a prize to the best student and using that prize for further study. Uh, I special small note. The prize is not to make a nice travel to all kinds of nice cities. It's especially used to stimulate further study, probably abroad or somewhere else, to really uh, develop yourself further. And also for the uh, master thesis best prize, um, we uh, are pleased to give uh, award for that and to use the money also for further study in some of the areas. Um, and first of all, uh, I have the jury report and I will uh, uh, present it uh, shortly, but all persons which are named, which are nominated, are already on the top of their group. Uh, the people which are nominated here are nominated by the schools of this university. So, in fact, it is not one award, maybe one award really is handed over, but I think we need to give applaud, applause to all nominees because they already are the top of this university in each school, both from a bachelor point of view as from a master's thesis point of view. I want to express that especially because at the end there's only one winner, but all the other people are very special and we also hope that they see this prize or award or this nominee as a further stimulus to develop yourself further. Well, let me come to the, let's call first the Vrienden of Copenhagen Scholarship, which is for the best <laughs> bachelor student. And the two criteria we have looked at from a jury point of view is both academic excellence, 
but also especially societal, societal relevance, because as we have a theme from the university, understanding society, then it's very important that it's not only about academic relevance. And of course, as I said, we like you to spend the award on what we call executive education. Well, let me first go to the nominees of the Vrienden van Copenhagen Scholarship, so that's for the best bachelor student. The first is Pearl from Lockhausen from the Bachelor of Psychology. Secondly, Christina Koenig. And I know that most of you are present. Maybe it's nice that the one who are present that they stand up so that all the rest know who they are. So maybe probably first Pearl. I don't know where Pearl is. There's Pearl. Christina Koenig. <laughs> Valerie, and I have to announce it precisely, Puchel. <laughs> and Remco Geervliet, he took a lot of time to specially come out from Oxford. Yes, those are the, the four nominees. And, and maybe for your understanding, the jury consists of myself, Patrick Vermeulen from the board of uh, the Vrienden van de Kopenhagen Foundation, Emile Aert, Koen Becking, Sylvester Eifinger, and Frederik Knoet. And together we have come together and tried to come to a conclusion. Well, we considered five nominees for the Vrienden of Kopenhagen Prize and four nominees for the Vrienden of Kopenhagen Scholarship. Those nominees have been nominated by their respective schools. And we were very impressed by the quality and the excellence of all nominees. Uh, this is the creme de la creme of our student community. And the schools were only allowed to nominate per category only the best students were selected to compete for the Vrienden of Copenhagen Scholarship and Prize. And as I just presented uh, the nominees of the Vrienden of Copenhagen Scholarship, it's a great honor for me now to report you on the conclusion of the jury. Um, if we all nominees have obtained exceptional academic results and show personalities and profile that makes Tilburg University proud. The nominees are students that go further than their regular curriculum, our curriculum that they will pass with flying colors, and show real interest in becoming a full person, participate in a large range of extracurricular facilities, and are driven to advance society in a way that the founder of this university, Martinez Kopenhagen, has described. And we were finally anonymous about the winner of the scholarship, Vrienden of Copenhagen scholarship, and we are very pleased to announce that Pearl has won the scholarship. So Pearl, <laughs> please. I will read the, the final conclusion. The jury was particularly impressed by Pearl. She wrote an excellent bachelor thesis that her department uh, is currently, together with Pearl, turning into a thesis into an academic article. And that, especially for a bachelor student, is very special. And so that's one. Per second, Pearl has shown her ability to not only consider her own discipline, but also others too. On top of that, she has an international profile, and of all nominees, Pearl is a student who takes the most effort to use her understanding of society in order to advance society, and therefore, it's our choice for the Vrienden of Copenhagen Prize. So, we decided to award you this award, this first award, so we are very pleased with that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Now, now I go to the Vrienden of Copenhagen Prize, which is for the best master thesis um, from the different schools. And again, those are uh, put forward by all the schools to the jury. The first is, is Frederik Hafkamp. I don't know if Frederik is... There was Frederik. I'm gonna not... I do not gonna read all the theses, because some of them are very specific subjects, but again, um, very good theses. <laughs> Mike Michael Spikmans. <laughs> Third one, Susanne Hendrikse. Fourth one, Thomas Kuipers. And the fifth one, Yvonne Bolsius. Yes, and now uh, it's like an Oscar uitreiking. Uh, the final, who is the winner? It's a very honor to us, and we are very pleased that Susanne Hendrikse is the winner for the first Vrienden of Hagen Prize. So please, Susanne, come forward. Let me first uh, present to you what we wrote. You wrote an absolute masterpiece with considerable relevance for our society, something that already was acknowledged by a prize of the Tilburg University in November for economic uh, excellence, of academic excellence, and uh, that was very special. Uh, you managed to look at societal challenge from three completely different angles and left the reader with some very good conclusions and questions for further research and we can be sure to see more of this kind of research in the years coming forward. Uh, it, was for, it was first difficult because all theses were very good at a very high profile, but we still believe, and we all were anonymous in that, that uh, we selected you because your research theme will become extremely relevant in the years to come. Uh, the, the whole industrial and the technolo technological revolution that will change society and everything what you are writing down is for us uh, a subject that will become very relevant and will be also a challenge for society. And hopefully also this university will contribute to uh, give the answers maybe to that. You dealt with the theme in a very clear and methodo methodological way and the thesis reads like a novel. So again, we are very pleased to award you this prize and hopefully it stimulates you to further study in this area. I can't do that ball. Can do that ball. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Finally, uh, both winners, we will uh, we will offer them also uh, a first free year membership of uh, our foundation. <laughs> and of course, we hope that you will stay a friend forever, uh, because we like to have original thoughts among our friends. So before we come to a final conclusion of this afternoon, the official program, um, I'd like to hand over the floor to uh, Koen Becking, um, which will speak the final words, the closing words of this uh, official part. Koen. Thank you, Oswald. Um, it's my honor and pleasure on behalf of the executive board to thank you all for being here. Uh, especially uh, the mayor of Tilburg, uh, 
Petron Udanas, who is amongst us, and the representative of uh, our province of North, Northern Brabant, Bert Pauli. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, friends, for being here. Uh, prospective friends, please join the Vrienden van Copenhagen. You are more than welcome, also on behalf of the executive board. Um, thank you, Professor uh, Eifinger and Professor uh, Roderick, for your great, inspiring lecture. Um, he, he already mentioned it, but, but the professor is also active on Twitter, uh, and we just briefly discussed, uh, talked about it. Um, and, and, and as you know, people nowadays, especially Americans that are active on, twi on Twitter, <laughs> get, get a lot of attention, um, especially those speaking truth to power, professor. Uh, so maybe that's also an explanation why you have so much uh, media attention these days. But thank you very much for being here. And of course, um, we are extremely proud of all these young talents here. Uh, the nominees and the prize winners. Um, we, we really enjoyed reading your work and um, we were very, very impressed about our future that is currently here. So thank you very much for being here and uh, please join us for having a drink. Thank you.